A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. Theseus, Duke of Athens, Aegeus, father to Hermia, Lysander and Demetrius, in love with Hermia. Illustrate, master of the revels to Theseus. Quince, a carpenter, Snug, a joiner, Bottom, a weaver, Flute, a bellows mender, Snout, a tinker, Starveling, a tailor, Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, Betrothed to Theseus. Hermia, daughter to Aegeus, in love with Lysander. <clears throat> Helena, in love with Demetrius. Oberon, king of the fairies. Titania, queen of the fairies. Puck or Robin, good fellow. Teas, blossom, cobweb, moth, mustard seed. Fairies, other fairies attending their king and queen. Attendant on Theseus and Hippolyta. Scene, Athens, and a wood near it. Act 1, Scene 1. Athens, the palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, <coughs> Philostrate, and attendants. Theseus, now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But, oh, methinks, how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like to a stepdame or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Hippolyta, four days will quickly steep themselves in night, four nights will quickly dream away the time, and then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemn solemnities. Theseus, go, Philostrate, stir up the Athenian youth to merriments, awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth, turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Exit Philostrate. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love, doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in other key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Enter Aegeus, Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Aegeus, happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Theseus, thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Aegeus, full of vexation, come I, with complaint, uh, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius, my noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander, and my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her lines, and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung. With feigning voice, verses of feigning love, And stolen the impression of her fantasy, With bracelets of thy hair, rings, gods, conceits, Knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers, Messengers of strong prevailment, And unhardened youth, with cunning, Hast thou filched my daughter's heart, Turn her obedience, which is due to me to stubborn harshness, and my gracious duke. Be it so, she'll not hear before your grace. Consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. <clears throat> Theseus, what say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and, with, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. Hermia, so is Lysander. Theseus, in himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice. The other must be held the worthier. Hermia. I would my father looked, but with my eyes. Theseus. Rather your eyes must with his judgment look. Hermia. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case. 
if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Theseus, he dared to die the death, or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of an un. For I to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon, thrice blessed, they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled, than that which withering on the virgin thorn rose lives and dies in single blessedness. Hermia, so will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent tub unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Theseus, take time to pause, and, by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and thee, for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius, as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest, for I, austerity and single life. Demetrius, Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. <clears throat> now, Lysan Lysander, you have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's do marry him. Aegeus, scornful Lysander, true, he hath my love, and what is mine my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. Lysander, I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his, my fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius is, and, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, all about it to his head, made love to Nidar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. Theseus, I must confess that I have heard so much, and what Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of, of self affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yield you up, which by no means we may extenuate, to death, or to a vow of single life. Come, my Apollota, what cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial, and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. Aegeus. With duty and desire we follow you. Exunt, all but Lysander and Hermia. Lysander, how now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Hermia, he like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. Lysander, ay me, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. Hermia, oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Lysander, or else misgraft in respect of years. Hermia, oh, spite, too old to be engaged too young. Lysander, or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Hermia, oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Lysander, or if there were a sympathy in choice, or death or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning of the galide night, that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick bright things come to confusion. Hermia. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross. 
as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, for fancy's followers. Lysander, a good persuasion, therefore hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no title. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance to a morn of May. There will I stay for thee. Hermia, my good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burneth the Carthage queen, when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever ever woman spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me. Tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Lysander, keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. Enter Helena. Hermia, God speed, fair Helena, whither away? Helena, call you me, fair, that fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair, your eyes are load stars, and your tongue's sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. When wee is queen, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching, oh, for favor is so. Yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye, your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet, sweet melody. For the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. I would teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. Hermia, I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Helena, oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. Hermia, I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Helena, oh, that my prayers could such affection move. Hel Hermia, the more I hate, the more he follows me. Helena, the more I love, the more he hateth me. <clears throat> Hermia, his folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. Helena, none but your beauty, would that fault were mine. Hermia, take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then, what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Lysander, Helen, to you, our minds we'll unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lover's flight doth still conceal, through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. Hermia, and in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, or want to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet. There my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes, to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. Lysander, I will, my Hermia, Exit Hermia. Helena, adieu. As you on him, Demetrius, dote on you. Exit. Hermia. Helena, how happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, holding no quantity. Love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind, nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste, and therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled, as waggish boys in game themselves forswear. 
So the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I'll go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her, and for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Exit. Act two. Act um, scene two. Athens, Quince's house. Enter Quince, snug, bottom, flute, snout, and starveling. Quince, is all our company here? Bottom, you are best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Quince, here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. Bottom, first, good Peter Quince. Say what the play treats on, then read the names of the, ap the actors, and so grow to a point. Quince. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Bottom. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and Mary. Now, good Peter, Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Quince. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Bottom. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. Quince. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. Bottom. What is Pyramus? A lover or tyrant? Quince. A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Bottom. That'll ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I'll move storms. I'll condole in some measure. To the rest, yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Urkel's rarely, or a part to tear a cat in, to make all split the raging rocks, and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus's car shall shine from far, and make and mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. Now, name the rest of the players. This is Urkel's vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover, a lover is more condoling. Quince. Francis Flute, the bellows lender. Flute. Here, Peter Quince. Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. Flute. What is Thisbe, a wandering knight? Quince. It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Flute. Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. Quince. That's all one. You shall play it in mask, and you may speak as small as you will. Bottom. And I may hide my face. Let me play Disney too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Disney, Disney. Ah, Pyramus, my lover dear. Thy Thisbe dear and lady dear. Quince. No, no. You must play Pyramus and flute you Disney. Bottom. Well, proceed. Quince. Robin Starveling the tailor. Starveling. Here, Peter Quince. Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout the Tinker. Snout. Snout. Here, Peter Quince. Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner. You, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Snug. Have you the lion's part written? Pray, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of study. Quince. You may do it ex tempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Bottom. Let me play the lion too. I'll roar. That I'll do any man's heart good to hear me. I'll roar. That I'll make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. Quince. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the duchess and the ladies. That they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. All. Oh. That would hang us, every mother's son. Bottom, I grant you, friends, that if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my, vo my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and twirl any nightingale. Quince, 
You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely, gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Bottom. Well, I won't. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Quince. Why, what you will. <clears throat> Put bottom. I'll discharge it in either your straw color beard, your orange tunny beard, your purple and green beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Quince. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you'll play beard faced. But, masters, here are your parts, and I'm to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town by moonlight. There will we rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company, and our devices known. In the meantime, I'll draw a bill of properties, such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. Bottom. We will meet, and there we may rehearse, most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect, adieu. Quince. At the duke's oak we meet. Bottom. Enough. Hold your cup of strings. Exeunt. Act, <clears throat> Act 2, Scene 1. A wood near Athens. Enter from opposite sides a fairy and Puck. Puck. How now, spirit, whither wander you? Fairy. Over hill, over dale, thorough bush, thorough briar. Over park, over pale, thorough flood, thorough fire. I do wander everywhere. Swifter than the moon's sphere, and I do serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tar her pensioners be in their gold coats, spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favors, and those freckles live their savors. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen, queen, and all her elves, elves come here on. But the king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the queen, come not within a sight, for Oberon is passing fell and wrath, because that she as her attendant hath a lovely boy, stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling, and jealous Oberon would have the child knight of a tr of his train to trace the forests wild. But she perforce withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet and go for queen by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do square that all their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Fairy, either I mistake your shape and make you quite, or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk and sometimes labor in the kern, and bootless make the breathless housewife turn? and some time make the drink to their no farm, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. There's the hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, you do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Puck, thou speakest aright. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon, and make him smile, when I a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal, and sometimes lurk I in a gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab, and when she drink, drinks against her lips I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale, the wisest stunt, telling the saddest tale, sometime for three foot stool mistaketh me, then slip by from her bum, down topples she, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough, and then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and wax and in their mirth, and knees and swear, a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. Fairy, and here my mistress, would that he were gone. Enter from one side Oberon, with his train, from the other, Titania with hers. Oberon, ill met by moonlight, proud Titania, Titania. What, jealous Oberon, fairies, skip hence. I forsworn his bed and company. I have forsworn his bed and company. Oberon, tarry, rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Titania, then I must be thy lady. 
but I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Felida. Why art thou here? Come from the farthest deep of India. But that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, Amazon, your buskin mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. Obron. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering light, light from Haraguna, whom he ravished, and make him with fair eagles break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopa? Titania. These are the forgeries of jealousy, and never, since the middle summer spring, met we on hill and dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the brief beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets through the whistling wind. But with thy bras thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs which falling in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain. The plowman lost his sweat, and the grain corn hath rotted, ere his youth attained the beard. The fold stands empty in the drowning field, and crows are fatted with the murrian flock. The nine men's moors is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes no, in the wanton grain for lack of tread are undistinguishable. The humor mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him, or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air, that, rheumat <coughs> that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this to temperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old times thin an icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is, as in mockery, set the spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change, their wanted libraries, and the mazed world, by their increase, now knows not which is which, and this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Oberon, do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be, a hench to be my henchman. Titania, set your heart at rest. The fairy man buys not the child of me. His mother was a votaress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traitors on the flood. When we have laughed to see the seals conceive and grow big-bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait, following her womb then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again, as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. Oberon, how long within this wood intend you stay? Titania, perchance till after Theseus' wedding day, if you'll patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Oberon, give me that boy, and I'll go with thee. Titania, not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall chide down right if I longer stay. Exit Titania with her train. Oberon, well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove, till I torment thee for the century. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory, and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back, uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath, that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. Puck, I remember, Oberon, that very time I saw that thou couldst not, Flying between the cold moon and the earth. Cupid, all armed, a stern name he took, at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young, Cu young Cupid's fiery shaft, 
quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon. And the imperial votaress passed it on in maiden meditation, fancy free, yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, the a milk white, now purple with love's wound. And maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I shewed thee once. The juice of it, on sleeping eyelids laid, will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next life creature that, that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again, ere the Leviathan can swim a league. Puck, I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Exit. Oberon, having once this juice, I'll watch to tongue you when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love, and ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I'm invisible, and I'll overhear their conference. Enter Demetrius, Helena following him. Demetrius, I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? But when I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou told'st me they were stolen unto this wood, and here my end woe within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get thee gone, and follow me no more. Helena, you draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Demetrius, do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? Helena, and even for that do I love you the more. I'm your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave, unworthy as I am to follow you. What worse or place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me than to be used as you use your dog? Demetrius, tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. Helena, and I am sick when I look, lock, when I look not on you. Demetrius, you do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of, of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Helena, your virtue is my privilege, for that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you and my respect are all the world. And how can it be said I am alone, when all the world is here to look on me? Demetrius, I'll run from thee, and hide me in the bricks, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. Helena, the wildest, hath not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed, Apollo flies, and Daphne holds the chase, the dove pursues the griffin, the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger, bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor, fly, valor flies. Demetrius, I will not stay thy questions, let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. Titania, oh, Helena, I, in the temple, in the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love, as men may do. We should be wooed and were not made to woo. Exit Demetrius. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Exit. Oberon, fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this robe, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Re enter Puck. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Puck. Ay, there it is. Oberon, I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank. Where the wild thyme, where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine, there sleeps Titania some time of the night, 
all of Bindi's flowers with dances and delight. And there, the snake throws her enamel skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, all streak her eyes, and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it, for the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Puck, fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. And Zunt. Scene two. Another part of the wood. Enter Titania with her train. Titania, come, now a roundel and a fairy song. Then, for the third part of the minute tense, some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, some war with rear mice for their leather and wings, to make my small elves coats, and some keep back the clamorous owl that lightly hoots and wanders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices and let me rest. The fairies sing, you spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Mute and blind worms do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby, lulla lulla lullaby, lulla lulla lullaby. Never harm nor spell nor charm, come our lovely lady nigh. So good night with lullaby, weaving spiders come not here. Hence you long-legged spinners, hence. Beetles black, approach not near. Worm nor snail do no offense. Fill a male with melody, etc. Fairy, hence away, now all is well. One loop stand sentinel. Exhumed fairies, Titania sleeps. Enter Oberon and squeezes the flower on Titania's eyelids. Oberon, what thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for a sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, Pard or boar with bristled hair, and thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest is thy dear. Wait when some vile thing is near. Exit. Enter Lysander and Hermia. Lysander, fair love, you faint with wandering the wood. And to speak troth, I have forgot our way. We'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Hermia, be it so, Lysander. Find you out of bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. Lysander, one turf shall serve as pillow for us both, one heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Hermia, nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. Lysander, oh, take the sense, sweet of my innocence, love takes the meaning of love's conference. I mean, that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart, we can make of it, two bosoms interchained with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side no bedroomy deny, for lying so Hermia, I do not lie. Hermia, my sander riddles very prettily. Now much for shrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, your love and courtesy lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as may well be said, Becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love near altar till thy sweet life end. Lysander, a man a man to that fair prayer say I, and then end life when I am royalty. Here is my bed, sleep, give thee all his rest. Hermia, with half that wish, the wisher's eyes be pressed. They sleep. Enter Puck. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none, on whose eyes I might prove this flower's force in stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despised the Athenian maid. And here the maiden, sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack love, this kill courtesy. Sure, upon thy eyes I throw, all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid, sleep his seat on thine eyelid. So wake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Exit.
Enter Demetrius and Helena. Running. Helena. Stay, do thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Helena. Oh, wilt thou darkling leave me? Do not so, Demetrius. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Exit. Helena. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is her me aware so e'er she lies. For she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears. If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear. For beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore no marvel though Demetrius do as a monster fly my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine beat me compare with Hermia's fury eyne? Look who is here. Lysander on the ground. Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. Lysander, awaking. And run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art, that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fitter word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Helena, do not say so, Lysander. See not so. What thou he love your Hermia? Lord, what thou? Yet Hermia still loves you. Then be content. Lysander, content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena, I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, so I being young, Till now, right not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will, and leads me to your eyes where I overlook love's stories written in love's richest book. Helena, wherefore was I to this keen mockery born, when at your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is not enough, it is not enough, young man, that I did never know, nor never can, Deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eye, but you must put out my insufficiency. Good troth, you do me wrong, good sooth you do, in such disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, for, fi uh, for force I must confess, I thought you lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused, should of another therefore be abused. Exit. Lysander, she sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there. And ever mayst thou come, Lysander, near. For as a surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing, loathing to the stomach brings. Or as the heresies that men do leave are hated most of those they did, de they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit, and my heresy of all be hated, but the most of me. In all my powers, address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. Exit. Hermia. Awaking, help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. I me for pity. What a dream was here. Lysander, look, how I do quake with fear. Methought a serpent eat my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander, what, removed? Lysander, Lord, what, out of hearing? Gone, no sound, no word. Alack, where are you? Speak, and if you hear, speak of all loves. I swoon almost with fear. No? Then I will perceive you are not nigh. Either death or you I'll find immediately. Exit. Act 3, Scene 1. The Wood. Titania lying asleep. Enter Quinn's snug bottom, flute, snout, and starveling. Bottom. Are we all met? Quince. Pat, pat. And here is a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this hawthorn drake our tiring house, and we'll do it in action as we'll do it before the duke. Bottom, Peter Quince, Quince, what sayst thou, bully Bottom? Bottom, there are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? Snout, by our lacking a parlous fear. Starveling. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Bottom. 
Out of it. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And, for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Quince. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in A and six. Bottom. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Snout. Will not the ladies be afeard of thine? Starveling. I fear it, I promise you. Bottom. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in God shield us. A lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing, for, this, for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Snout. Therefore another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Not a lion. Bottom. Nay, he must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he himself must speak through the same thus, or to the same defect. Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble, my life or yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, twere pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed, and there indeed let him name his name and tell them plainly he is not the joiner. Well, it shall be so, but there is two hard things, that is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber, for we know Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Snout. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? Bottom. A calendar, a calendar. Look in the almanac. Look in the almanac. Find out moonshine, find out moonshine. Quince. Yes, it doth shine that night. Bottom. Why? Then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window, where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. Quince. Aye, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern, and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus at Disby says the story did talk through the chink of the wall. Snout. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Bottom. Some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to, to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. Quince. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you've spoken, spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. Puck, what temp and homespuns have we swaggering here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen. What? A play tour? I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Quince. Speak, Pyramus. This be stand forth. Bottom. This be the flowers of odious savor sweet. Quince. Odors, odors, bottom, odors, savor sweet, so hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. But hark a voice, stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. Exit, Puck, a stranger pyramus than e'er played here. Exit, Flute, must I speak now? Quince, I, Mary, must you, for you must understand. He goes but to see a noise that he heard, and is to come again. Most radiant pyramus, most lily white of hue, of color like the red rose on triumphant briar, most frisky juvenile, and eke most lovely drew, as true as truest horse, that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, pyramus, at Nanny's tomb. Quince. Nine is his tomb, man. Why, you must not speak that yet, that you answer to pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is past. It is never tire. Flute. Oh, as true as truest horse that yet would never tire. We enter Puck and Bottom with an ass's head. Bottom, if our fair this be, I will only thine. Quince, O oh, monstrous, O oh, strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, why, masters, help. Exeunt Quince, Snug, <coughs> Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Puck, I'll follow you. I'll lead you about around. 
through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometimes a horse I'll lead, sometimes a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometimes a fire, and neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Exit. Bottom. Why did they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Be for snout. Snout. Oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? Bottom. What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Exit. Snout. We under quince. Quince. Bless thee, bottom. Bless thee. Thou art translated. Exit. Bottom. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I'll not stir from this place, do what they can. I'll walk up and down here, and I will sing, that they shall hear I am not afraid. Sings, you so cock so black of hue, with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with her so quill. The Tanya, awaking. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? Bottom sings, the finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose no full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer nay. For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, cuckoo, never so? Titania, I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtues pour force, for force doth move me on the first view to say, to swear I love thee. Bottom, methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet to say the truth, truth, reason, and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Nay, I can leak upon occasion. Tanya, thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Bottom, not so neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve my own turn. Titania, out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rape. The summers do not tend upon my state. And I do love thee, therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee. And they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep. And sing, while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I'll purge thy mortal grossness so, That thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace, blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Enter bees, peas blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Peas blossom, ready, cobweb, and I, moth, and I, mustard seed, and I, all. Where shall we go? To Danya, be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humblebees and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs, and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes, to have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies, to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes, not to him elves, and do him courtesies. Peas blossom, hail mortal, cobweb, hail, moth, hail, mustard seed, hail, bottom, I cry your worship's mercy heartily, I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb, cobweb, bottom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master cobweb. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman? Peas blossom, peas blossom, bottom, I pray you, commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peas, cod your father. Good master Peas blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance too. Your name, your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard seed, mustard seed. Bottom, good master mustard seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly, giant-like ox thief hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. I desire your more acquaintance, good master mustard seed. Titania, come, wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye. And when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my love's tongue, bring him silently. Exunt. Act, um, scene two, another part of the wood. Enter Oberon. Oberon, 
I wonder if Titania be awaked. Then, what it was that next came in her eye, which she must do on in extremity. Enter Puck. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? Puck. My mistress, but the monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated hour, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a grove patches, the rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse the play, intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallow, thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this disadvantage take, and asses now while I fixed on his head, and on his thisby must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. When they him spy as wild geese, that the creeping fowler I, or russet pated cuffs, many in sort, rising and calling at the gun's report, serve themselves and madly sweep the sky, so at his sight away his fellows fly. And at our stamp here o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries, and help from Athens calls, their sense thus weak, Lost with their fears thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. For briars and thorns at their peril snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yielders all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. But in that moment, so it came to pass, Tanya waked, and straightway loved an ass. Oberon, this falls out better than I could devise, but hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with a love deuce, as I did bid thee do? Puck. I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked, a force she must be eyed. Enter Hermia and Demetrius. Oberon. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. Puck. This is the woman, but not this the man. Demetrius. Oh, why rebuke you, him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Hermia. Now I but tie, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being or shoes in blood plunged in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon. This whole earth may be bored, and that the moon may through the center creep and so displease her brother's noontide with the Antipodes. It cannot be but thou hast murdered him, so should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. Hermia. O oh, Demetrius, so should the murderer look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. Hermia. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? Demetrius, I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. Hermia, out, dog, out, cur, thou drivest me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, what, tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou have looked upon him being wake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch, could not a warman adder do so much, and adder did it. Or with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never had a stung. Demetrius, you spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead, for aught that I can tell. Hermia, I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. Demetrius, and if I could, what should I get there for? Hermia, a privilege, never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. Exit. Demetrius. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow. For debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe. Which now in some slight measure it'll pay. If for us tender, here I make some stay. Lies down and sleeps. Oberon. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken fight and laid the love juice on some true love sight. Of thy misprision must perforce ensue some true love turned, and not a false term true. Puck, then fate all rules that one man holding troth, a million fail confounding oath on oath. 
Oberon, about the wood goes swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens wilt thou find, all fancy sick she is and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that costs the fresh blood dear. By some illusion see thou bring her here, all charm his eyes against she do appear. Pup, I go, I go, look I go, swifter than arrow from the Tartar's bow. Exit, Oberon. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye, when his love he doth espy, let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of, a, of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Re-enter Pup. Pup. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me, pleading for our lover's fee. Shall we there from pad and see? Lord, what fools these mortals be. Oberon. Stand aside, the noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Puck. Then will two at once were one. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me. That befall preposterously. Enter Lysander and Helena. Lysander. Why should you think that I should ruin scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep. And vow so born in their nativity, all truth appears. How can these things in me? Seems scorn to you, fearing the badge of faith to prove them true. Helena, you do advance your cunning more and more, but truth kills truth, O oh devilish holy fray. These vows are Hermia's, will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to hand me, put in two scales, will even weigh, and both as light as tails. Lysander, I had no judgment when to her I swore. <coughs> Demetri um, Helena, you're none in my mind, now you give her oar. Lysander, Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. Demetrius, awaking. O oh, Helena, goddess, nymph, perfect, divine, to what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy, oh, how ripe and show thine lips, those kissing cherries, tempting grow, that pure congealed white, high towards his snow, fanned with the eastern wind turns to a crow, when thou holdst up thy hand. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, the seal of bliss. Helena, oh, spite, oh, hell, I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and you courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use your gentle lady so, to vow and swear and super praise my parts, when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to knock Helena, a trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision, none of noble sort. Would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. Lysander, you are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. And here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up my part, and yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love, and will do till my death. Helena, never did mockers waste more idle breath. Demetrius, Lysander, keep thy Hermia, I will none, if ere I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her, but as guest wise so torn, and now to Helen is at home returned, there to remain. Lysander, Helen, it is not so. Demetrius, disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to that peril thou abide it dear. Look, where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Re-enter Hermia. Hermia, dark night that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick, more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not by mine eye Lysander found, mine ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Lysander, why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? Hermia, what love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander, my Sander's love, that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, whom more engilds the night, 
than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? Hermia, you speak not as you think it cannot be. Helena, lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you of these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent, when we have chid the hasty footed, the hasted footed time for parting us? Oh, is all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key. As if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate, so we grew together, like to a double cherry, seeming parted but yet an union in partition. Two lovely berries molded on one stem, so with two seeming bodies, but one heart, two of the first, like coats in heraldry, do but to one, and crowned with one crest. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, he is not maidenly. Our sex, as well as I, may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. Hermia, I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Hermia, have, uh, Helena, have you not set my sander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face, and made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, to call me goddess, nymph, divine, and rare, precious celestial? Wherefore speaks he this, to her he hates, and wherefore doth my sander deny your love, so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth, affection? But by your setting on, by your consent, what thought I be not so ungraced as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate but miserable most, to love unloved? This you should pity, rather than despise. Hermia, I understand not what you mean by this. Helena, I do, preserver, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, winky chat other, hold the sweet jest up. This sport, well carried, shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Lysander, stay, gentle Helena, hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Helena, thou oh, excellent, Hermia, sweet, do not scorn her so. Demetrius, if she cannot entreat, I can compel. Lysander, thou canst compel no more than she entreat. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee, by my life I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee, to prove him false that says I love thee not. Demetrius, I say I love thee more than he can do. Lysander, if thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Demetrius, quick, come. Hermia, Lysander, where to tends all this? Lysander, away, you Ethiop. Demetrius, no, no, sir, still seems to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man. Go, Lysander. Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing. Let loose, or I'll shake thee from me like a serpent. Hermia, why are you grown so rude? What change is this? Sweet love, Lysander, thy love. Out, tawny tartar, out. Out, loathed medicine. Hated potion, hence. Hermia, do you not jest? Helena, yes, soothe, and so do you. Lysander, Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. Demetrius, I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you, I'll not trust your word. Lysander, what, did I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. Hermia, what, can you do me greater harm than hate? 
hate me? Wherefore? Oh, me. What news, my love? Am not I Hermia, are not, are not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid. In earnest, shall I say? Lys Lysander, I, by my life, am, am never to desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope of question of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer, tis no guest, that I do hate thee and love Helena. Hermia, oh me, you juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stole my love's heart from him? Helena, fine I faith, have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What? Will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you Hermia. Puppet? Why so? I, that I, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth she hath, forsooth she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach into thine eyes. Helena, I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am right made for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Hermia. Lower? Hark again. Helena. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you. Save that, in love unto Demetrius, I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence, and threaten me, to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go, to Athens will I bear my folly back, and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Hermia, why get you gone? Who is it that hinders you? Helena, a foolish heart that I leave here behind. Helena, oh, Hermia, what, with Lysander? Helena, with Demetrius. Lysander, be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. Demetrius, no, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Helena, oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Hermia, little again, nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Lysander, Get you gone, you dwarf, you minimus, of hindering not grass made, you bee, you acorn. Demetrius, you are too officious, in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone, speak not of Helena, take not her part, for, if thou dost intend, never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Lysander, now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try who's the right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Demetrius, follow. Nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by dole. Exult Lysander and Demetrius. Helena, a uh, Hermia, you, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. Helena, I'll not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands than mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. Exit. Hermia, I am amazed, and know not what to say. Exit. Oberon, this is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else committest thy knaveries willfully. Puck, believe me, king of shadows, I am stuck. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far blameless, 
proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian dies, and so far am I glad it so did sort, as this dear jangling I esteem a sport. Oberon, thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hide there for Robin, overcast the night. The starry welkin cover thou went on, with drooping fog as black as Acheron. And lead these testy rivals so astray, as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thy like Demetrius, and from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep, with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to date, to take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend, with league whose date till death shall never wend, never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I owe to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. Puck. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste, for night's swift dragons cut the clouds full fast. And yonder shines Aurora's cart harbinger, harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards, damn the spirits all, that in crossways and floods have burial, all ready to their warming beds are gone, for fear lest they should look their shames upon. They willfully themselves exile from night and must for I consort with black bra black browed knight. Um, they will find themselves exiled from light, and must for I consort with black browed knight. Oberon, but we are spirits of another sort. I, with the morning's love, have oft made sport. And, like a forester, the groves may tread, even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt green streams but notwithstanding haste make no delay we may effect this business yet ere day exit puck up and down up and down i will lead them up and down i am feared than field and town goblin lead them up and down here comes one re-enter lysander lysander where art thou proud demetrius speak thou now puck here villain drawn and ready where art thou Titania, oh, Lysander, I'll be with thee straight. Puck, follow me then to plainer ground. Exit Lysander as following the voice. Re-enter Demetrius. Demetrius, Lysander, speak again. Thou runaway, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush. Where dost thou hide thy head? Puck, thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars? Telling the bushes that thou look'st for wars, and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come thou child, I'll whip thee with a rod, he is defiled, that draws a sword on thee. Demetrius, yea, art thou there? Puck, follow my voice, we'll try no manhood here. Exeunt, re enter Lysander. Lysander, he goes before me, and still dares me on, when I call Mary calls. Then he is gone. The villain's much lighter heel than I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. That fallen and am I in dark and even way, and here will rest me, eyes down. Come, thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius, and revenge this fight sleeps. Re-enter Puck and Demetrius. Puck. Ho, ho, ho! Coward! Why comest thou not? Demetrius, abide me, if thou darest, or well I wot. Thou runst before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Puck, come hither, I am here. Demetrius, nay, then, thou mockest me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now, go thy way, faintness constraineth constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed, if 
by day's approach, loath to be visited, lies down and sleeps. Re enter Helena. Helena. Oh, weary night. O oh, long and tedious night, abate thy hours. Shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight. From these that my poor company detest, and sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye. Steal me a while from mine own company. Lies down and sleeps. Puck. Yet but three, come one more. Two of both kinds makes up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Re-enter Helena. Uh, re-enter Hermia. Hermia. Never so weary, never in so in woe, but dabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heavens, shield my standard, if they mean a prey. Lies down and sleeps. <clears throat> Puck, on the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle of a remedy, squeezing the juice on Lysander's eyes. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And let country proverb be known, that every man should take his own. In your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have two, not shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Exit. Act four, scene one. The same. Lysander, De Lysander Demetrius, Helena, and Hermia lying asleep. Enter Titania and Bottom, Peas Blossom, Cobweb, Moth, Mustard Seed, and other fairies attending. Oberon behind and sit. Oberon behind unseen. Titania. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Bottom. Where's Peas Blossom? Peas Blossom. Ready. Bottom. Scratch my head, Peas Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Cobweb. Ready. Bottom. Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur, get you your weapons in her hand, and kill me, a red-hipped humblebee, on the top of a thistle. And, good Monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret your, your felt, yourself too much in the action, Monsieur. And, good Monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I'd be loth to have you overflown with a honey bag, Signor. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Mustard Seed. Ready. Bottom. Give me your knee, Monsieur Mustard Seed. Pray you leave your courtesy, good Monsieur. Mustard Seed. What's your will? Bottom. Nothing, good Monsieur, but to help Cavalry Cobweb to scratch. I must to the barber's, Monsieur, for methinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. And I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. Titania. What? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? Bottom. I have reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. Titania. Or say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Bottom. Truly a peck of provender. I can munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. I, Titania. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. Bottom. I had rather have a handful or two of dry peas, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Titania, sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies be gone, and thee always away. Exeunt fairies. So doth the wood bind the sweet honeysuckle, gently and twist the female ivy so, and rings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. They sleep. Answer Puck, Oberon advancing. Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool. I then did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples then had rounded with the coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers, and that same dew which sometime on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now within the pretty flowerette's eyes, like tears that did their own disgrace bewail, 
when I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience. I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and a fairy sense of bear him to my power in fairyland. And now I have the boy. I'll undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And, gentle puck, take this, take this trans transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he awaking one the other do, may all to that and back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the fairy queen, be as thou wast wont to be, see as thou wast wont to see, Dian's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. Titania, my Oberon, what visions have I seen? He thought I was enamored of an ass. Oberon, there lies your love. Titania, how came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do low with his visage now. Oberon, silence a while. Robin, take off this head. Titania, music call, and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five descents. Titania, music call, music, such as charmeth sleep. Music still, pup, now when thou wakest with thine own fool's eyes peep. Oberon, sound music, come my queen, take hands with me, and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. Now thou and I are new in amity. And will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance and duke Theseus's house triumphantly, and bless it to all fair prosperity. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be, wedded with Theseus all in jollity. Puck. Fairy king, attend and mark. I do hear the morning lark. Oberon. Then my queen, in silence sad, trip we after the night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Titania. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. Exeunt, horns winded within. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegeus, and train. Theseus, go, one of you, find out the forester, for now our observation is performed. And since we have the favorite of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western. Western Valley, let them go. Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. Exit and attendant. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top, and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. Hippolyta, I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear. With hounds of Sparta, never did I hear such gallant chiding, for besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near, seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. Theseus, my hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, so flew, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crookneed, then do laughed like the Sicilian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched in mouth like bells. Each under each, a cry more tunable was never whole to nor cheered with horn in Crete and Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear, but soft, what nymphs are these? Aegeus, my lord, this is my daughter here asleep, and this Lysander, this Demetrius is, this Helena, old Nidar's Helena. I wonder of their being here together. Theseus, no doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent, came here in grace of our solemnity. But speak, Aegeus, is not this the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? Aegeus, it is, my lord. Theseus, go, bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Horns and shout within. Lysander, Demetrius, Helena, and Hermia wake and start up. Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine has passed. Begin these wood birds but a couple now. Lysander, pardon, my lord. Theseus, I pray you all, stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world? That hatred is so far from jealousy. To sleep by hate and fear no enmity? These, Lysander, my lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking, but as yet I swear, 
I cannot truly say how I came here, but as I think, for truly what I speak, and now to bethink me, so it is, I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law, Eugeus. Enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would, Demetrius, thereby to have defeated you and me, you of your wife, and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. <clears throat> Demetri Demetrius, my lord, fair Helena told me of their stealth, of this their purpose hither to this wood, and I am fury hither followed them, fair Helena in fancy following me. But, my good lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia melted as the snow, seems to me now as the remembrance of an idol god, which in my childhood I did dote upon, and all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but like in sickness did I loathe this food, but as in health, come to my natural taste. Now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will for evermore be true to it. Theseus, fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse we mortal hear none. Eudeus, I'll overbear your will, for in the temple by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit, and for the morning now is something worn. Our purpose tunting shall be set aside. Away with us to Athens, three and three. We'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. Exempt Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegeus, and Train. These, Demetrius, these things seem small and undistinguishable, like far off mountains turn it into clouds. Hermia, methinks I see these things with parted eye, when everything seems double. Helena, so methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Demetrius, are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Do not you think the duke was here and bid us follow him? Hermia, yea, and my father, Helena, and Hippolyta, Lysander, and he did bid us follow to the temple. Demetrius, why then we are awake. Let's follow him, and by the way, let us recount our dreams. Exeunt. Bottom, awaking. When my cue comes, call me, and I will answer. My next is, most fair Pyramus. Hi ho, Peter Quince, lute the battle's mender, snout the tinker, starveling, God's my life stolen hence, and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Has the wit of man to say what dream it was? Man is but an ass, if he would go about to expound this dream. Me thought I was, there is no man can tell what. Me thought I was, and me thought I had, but man is but a patched fool. If he will offer to say what me thought I had, the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I'll get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I'll sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke, poor adventure, to make it the more gracious. I shall sing it at her death. Ex exit. Scene 2. Athens, Quince's house. Enter Quince, Lute, Snout, and Starveling. Quince, have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? Starveling, he cannot be heard of. Out of doubt he is transported. Lute, if he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward, doth it? Quince, it is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus but he. Flute. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. Quince. Yea, and the best person, too. And he is a very paramour for a sweet voice. Flute. You must say paragon. A paramour is, God bless, as a thing of naught. Enter Snug. Snug. Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Flute. 
toes to meet Bully Bottom, thus had he lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not have escaped sixpence a day, and the Duke had not given given him sixpence a day for playing Pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day in Pyramus or nothing. Enter Bottom. Bottom. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Quince. Bottom. Oh, most courageous day. Oh, most happy hour. Bottom. Bastards, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what. For if I tell you I am no true Athenian, I will tell you everything, right as it fell out. <clears throat> Quince. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. Bottom. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together. Good strings to your beards. New ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look o'er his part. But the short and the long is, our play is preferred. In any case, let this be have coon linen. And let not him that plays the lion pare his nails. For they shall hang out for the lion's claws. And most dear actors eat no onions nor garlic. For we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt but to hear them say, It is a sweet, it is a sweet comedy. No more words away, go away. Exeunt. <clears throat> Acts 5, scene 1. Athens, the palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, lords and attendants. Hippolyta. Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. Theseus. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Such tricks have strong imagination, that, if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? Hippolyta. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Theseus, here come the lovers full of joy and mirth. Enter Lysander, Demetrius, Hermia, and Helena. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. Theseus, more than, um, Lysander, more than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board your bed. Theseus, Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call Philostrate. Philostrate. Here, mighty Theseus. Theseus. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask? What music? How shall we beguile the lazy time? if not with some delight. <clears throat> Philostrate. There is a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your highness will see first. Giving, giving a paper, Theseus reads, The battle with the centaurs, to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. Will none of that, that have I told my love, and glory of my kinsman Hercules. Reads, The riot of the tipsy bacchanals. Tearing the Thracian singer in the rage. That is an old device, and it was played my from Thebes came last to conqueror. Reads The thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, lay deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. Reads A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe, Thisbe, very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical! Tedious and brief, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? Philostrate. A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play. 
but by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For in all the play, there is not one word apt, one player fitted. And tragical, my noble lord, it is, for Pyramus dare not kill himself, which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter never shed. Theseus, what are they that do play it? Philistrate, hard-handed men, that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have told their unbreathed memories, with this same play against your nuptial. Theseus, and we will cure it. Philistrate, no, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find, find a sport in their intense, intense, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. Theseus, I will cure that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in and take your places, ladies. Exit Philostrate. If I don't tell, I love not to see wretchedness or charged and duty in his service perishing. Theseus, why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. Theseus, Hippolyta, he says they can do nothing in this kind. Theseus, the kinder we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake, and what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes in the might not merit. Where I have come, Great clerks have proposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes, premeditated welcomes, where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst, midst of sentences, throttle their practice accent in their fears, and in conclusion, dumbly have broke off, not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, out of this silence yet I picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much as from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, at least speak most to my capacity. Re-enter Philostrate. Philostrate, so please your grace, the prologue is addressed. Theseus, let him approach. Flourish of trumpets. Enter Quince for the prologue. Prologue, if we offend, it is with our good will, that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will, to show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you, our true intent is, all for your delight. We are not here, that you should here repent you. The actors are at hand, and by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. Theseus, this fellow doth not stand upon points. Lysander, he hath rid his prologue like a rough colt. He knows not to stop. A good moral, my lord, it is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Hippolyta, indeed he hath played on his prologue like a child and a recorder, a sound but not in government. Theseus, his speech was like a tangled cane, nothing impaired but all disordered. Who is next? Unto Pyramus and Thisbe, while moonshine and lion. Prologue. Gentles, perchance you wonder at this stroke, but wonder on, till truth make all things plain. This man as is Pyramus, if you will know, this beauteous lady Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder. And through wall sting poor souls, they are content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn, presenteth moonshine. For if you will know by moonshine, did these lovers think their scorn to meet at Lance's tomb, there, there to woo. This grisly beast, which lion height by name, your trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did a flight of fright, and as she fled her mantle, she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trust Trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, thereat with blade, with bloody flameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast. And Thisbe, tearing in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion moonshine wall and lovers twain, and our discourse, while here they do remain. Exunt. Exunt. Prologue, Pyramus, Thisbe, Lion, and Moonshine.
Theseus, I wonder if the lion be asleep. Demetrius, no, rem no, rem no wonder, my lord. One lion may when many asses do. Walk. In this same interlude doth befall that I, once knelt by name, present a wall, and such a wall as I would have you think that had in it a cranny hole or chink, through which the lover's pyramus of Thisbe did whisper often very secretly, This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show that I am that same wall, the truth is so. And this the cranny is, right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. Theseus. This fellow doth not stand upon points. Um, through which the fear... Oh, no. The truest of this cranny is right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. <clears throat> Theseus, Theseus, would you desire lime and hair to speak better? Demetrius, it is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. Theseus, Pyramus draws near the wall. Silence. Re enter Pyramus. Pyramus. O oh, grim looked knight. O oh, knight with hue so black. O oh, knight which ever art when day is not. O oh, knight, O oh, knight, alack, alack, alack. I fear my Thisbe's promises forgot. And thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet and lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine. Thou wall, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet and lovely wall, <clears throat> show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. Wall hope it holds up his fingers. Thanks, courteous Wall. Jove shall be well for this. But what's the eye? No thisbe do I see. A wicked Wall, through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be, but be thy stones for thus deceiving me. Theseus. The Wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. Pyramus. No in truth, sir, he should not. Deceiving me is thisbe's cue. She is to enter now. And I am to spy her through the wall. You shall see. It'll fall pat, as I told you, yonder she comes. Re enter Thisbe. Thisbe. O oh, wall, full often, often hast thou heard my moans, for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair nipped up in thee. Pyramus. I see a voice. Now I to the tink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe. Thisbe. My love thou art, my love I think. Pyramus, think what thou wilt. I am thy lover's grace, and like thy mander am I trusty still. Thisbe, and I like Helen till the fates me kill. Pyramus, not Shaphelus to Procruce was so true. Thisbe, as Shaphelus to Procruce, I to you. Pyramus, thou kissed me through the hole of this vile wall. Thisbe, I kissed the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Pyramus, Wilt thou at Nanny's true meet me straight away? Thisbe, tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Exunt, Pyramus, and Thisbe. Wall, thus have I, wall, my part discharged so, and being done, thus wall away doth go. Exit. Theseus, now is the mural down between, between the two neighbors. Demetrius, <clears throat> no remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to heal without warning. Hippolyta, this is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. Theseus, the best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse, if imagination amend them. Hippolyta, it must be your imagination then, and not theirs. Theseus, if we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in a man and a lion. We enter lion and moonshine. Lion, you ladies, you whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor, may now perchance both wake and tremble here, when lion rough and wildest rage doth roar. Then know that I, one snug the joiner am, a lion fell, nor else no lion stand. For if I should as lion come and strife into this place, twere pity on my life. Theseus, a very gentle beast, and of a good conscience. Demetrius, the very best at a beast, my lord, that e'er I saw. Lysander, this lion is a very fox for his valor. Theseus, true and a goose for his discretion. Demetrius, not so, my lord, for his valor cannot carry his discretion, and the fox carries the goose. Theseus, 
His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valor, for the goose carries not the fox. It is well. Leave it to his discretion, and let us listen to the moon. Moonshine. <clears throat> this lantern doth the horned moon present. Demetrius. He should have worn the horns on his head. Theseus. He is no present, and his horns are invisible within the circumference. Moonshine. This lantern doth the horn moon present. Myself, the man of the moon, do seem to be. Theseus. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put into the lantern. How is it else the man in the moon? Demetrius. He dares not come there for the candle, for you see it is already in snuff. Hippolyta. I am aweary of this moon. Would he would change? Theseus. It appears by his small light of discretion that he is in the wing, but yet in courtesy and all reason, he must stay the time. Lysander. Proceed, moon. Moonshine. All that I have to say is to tell you that the lantern is the moon. I, the man, it's a moon. This thorn bush, my thorn bush, and this dog, my dog. Demetrius. Why, all these should be in the lantern, for all these are in the moon. But silence. Here comes Thisbe. We enter Thisbe. Thisbe. This is old Minnie's tomb. Where is my love? Lion roaring. Thisbe runs off. Oh. Demetrius. Well, roar, line. Theseus. Well, run, Thisbe. Hippolyta. Well, show, moon. Truly, the moon shines with a good grace. The lion shakes Thisbe's mantle and exit. Demetrius. Uh, Theseus. Well, mouse, line. Demetrius. And then came Pyramus. Mm, Lysander. And so the lion vanished. Re enter Pyramus. Pyramus. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy bait, for by thy gracious golden glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest this beside. But stay, with spite, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here. Why, do you see? How can it be? Oh, dainty duck, oh dear, thy manful good, what, stained with blood? Approach, ye theories fell. O oh, fates, come, come. Cut thread and thrum, quail, crush, conclude and quell. Theseus, this passion, and the death, and the death of a dear friend, would go near to make a man look sad. Hippolyta, beshrew my heart, but I pity the man. Pyramus, O oh, wherefore nature didst thou lions frame? Since lion vile hath here deflowered my dear, which is no no, which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. Come, tears confound, out sword and wound, the path, the path of Pyramus. I that left path, where heart doth hop, stabs himself. Thus die I, thus, thus, thus. Now am I dead, now am I fled, my soul is in the sky. Come, lose thy light, moon, take thy flight. Exit moonshine. Now die, 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 die. Dies, Demetrius. No die, but an ace, for him, for he is but one. Lysander. Less than an ace, man, for he is dead, he is nothing. Theseus, with the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and prove an ass. Hippolyta, how chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? Theseus, she'll find him by starlight. Here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Re enter Thisbe. Hippolyta, methinks she should not use a long one for such a pyramus. I hope she will be brief. Demetrius, a moat will turn the balance, which Pyramus, which Thisbe is the better. He for a man, God warrant us, she for a woman, God bless us. Lysander, she hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. Demetrius, and thus she means Fidelicent. Thisbe, asleep, my love? What, dead, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise, speak, speak, quite dumb. Dead, dead, a tomb, must cover thy sweet eyes. These lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cowslips cheek, are, cheeks are gone, are gone. Lovers make moan. His eyes were green as leeks. Oh, sisters three, come, come to me, with hands as pale as milk. Lay them on gore, since you have sure, with shears of, with shears of thread of silk. Tongue, not a word. Come, trusty sword. Come, blade my breast and brew. Stabs herself. And farewell, friends. Thus this be ends. A 
adieu, 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 dies. Theseus, Moonshine, and Lion are left to bury the dead. Demetrius, I and Wall too. Bottom starting up. No, I assure you, the wall is down that part of their fathers. Fathers, will it please you to see the epilogue? Or to hear a bird mask dance between two of our company? Theseus, no epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when the players are all dead, there are need none to, none to be blamed. Mary, if he that rid it had played pyramids and hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy, and so it is truly, and very notably discharged. But come, your bird mask, let your epilogue alone. But dance. The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve. Lovers to bed, tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn, as much as we this night, this night have overwatched. This palpable, gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends to bed, a fortnight told we this solemnity, in nightly revels and new jollity. Exeunt. Enter Puck. Um, now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task were done. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl screeching loud, puts the wretch that lies in woe, in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night, that the graves are gaping wide. Every one lets forth his sprite, in the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream. Now, our frolic, not a mouse, shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Enter Oberon and Titania with your train. Oberon, through the house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird from briar, and this ditty after me sing and dance a trippingly. Tanya, first rehearse your song by rote, to each word a warbling note, hand in hand with fairy grace, the wasting and bless this place. Sung and dance. Oberon, now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray, to the best bride bed will we, which by us shall blessed be, and the issue there create, ever shall be fortunate, so shall all the couples three, ever true and loving be, and the bolts of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand, Never mole hair lip nor scar, nor mark prodigious such as are, despised in nativity, shall upon their children thee. With this field you consecrate, every fairy take his gate, and each several chamber bless, through this palace with sweet peace, and the owner of it blessed, ever shall in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay, meet me all by break of day. Exeunt. Oberon, Titania, and Train. Puck. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumber here, while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend, if you pardon, we'll mend, and as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to save, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we'll make amends ere long, else the puck and I call, so good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore men's. Exit.